it's Jeff Weber here. I'm sort of the, uh, the, the, the ringmaster here. And I just want to say a few words about George. Uh, George is an outstanding dermatopathologist and pathologist. He's a great guy. Uh, we rely on him enormously. Uh, he's our go-to person whenever we have a question about any melanoma pathology, anything under the microscope, we're not sure what it is. George is the man. So he's going to talk to you today sort of about the, the pathology and more the, the, the basic science of, of melanoma. George, please. Thank you, Jeff, for this kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for having me today. It's such a great pleasure uh, to be talking to you about a topic that is dear to my heart. Uh, it's such really an honor to be with you. I'm just going to share my screen now. Let's see. I hope my screen is up now. Yes, I see it. Perfect. So today I'm going to be talking to you, as Jeff said, uh, about the causes and the pathology of melanoma, which is a pretty broad topic, but I'm going to try to hone down on very important take home messages for everyone. Uh, I do not have any conflict of interest that relates to this particular talk. And this is my outline. I will just tackle some epidemiological facts. We'll move to talk about some etiological factors in melanoma. Then we will discuss briefly the molecular mechanisms underlying melanoma formation and oncogenesis. And then we will finish with the current WHO classification of melanoma and with some concluding remarks. Melanoma is in the incidence of melanoma in the United States is on the rise. And this year data from 2021 shows shows an actual increase in the number of new cases of diagnosed melanoma with a projected number of cases around 106,000 for 2021 with melanoma ranking number five among the top five cancers and representing around six percent of newly diagnosed cancers in the United States. On a good note, melanoma mortality is decreasing and this at least in part is related to aggressive screening methodologies and strategies as well as novel therapies in the field of melanoma. Oops. Melanoma tends, the incidence of melanoma is higher in the male population compared to the female population across different races with a median age of diagnosis at 65. And this is also mirrored in the mortality, where the mortality is higher in males compared to females across different races, with an actual median age at death at 71 years. So what really causes melanoma? I'm highlighting here some of the most important causative etiological factors that have been studied extensively and related to melanoma. Ultraviolet radiation exposure, phenotypic traits, personal history of melanoma, the presence of typical nevi and atypical nevi, and of course, the genetic background or the family history of melanoma. We'll start first with UV radiation. UV radiation comes in different shapes, tastes, and flavors. There are three main UV radiations or lights that we deal with, which are UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVA and UVB are usually the most important players in melanoma genesis. UVB is the shorter type of ray that usually burns your skin. UVA is the one that is responsible for skin damage and skin aging and usually has a higher penetrance in the dermis all the way up to the subcutaneous tissue at times. Both of them are equally involved in melanoma genesis. And really what happens when the actual melanocytes, which are the quiescent cells sitting in the cell, are exposed to these particular type of uh, rays is that in on, on the contrary of keratinocytes, keratinocytes die when they're actually exposed to these, ray, to these rays. While melanocytes, they start to proliferate in a very uncontrolled fashion that sometimes can go wrong and leads to melanoma development. It's very important also to note that the pattern of exposure to these UV rays is very important because melanomas tend to be associated with intense intermittent sun exposure and sunburns rather than just chronic exposure, which is usually associated with non-melanoma skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. Not surprisingly, and I know this is a very, uh, a little bit of a busy slide, but not surprisingly, melanoma ranks among the cancers with the highest tumor mutational burden, which is usually the number of mutations per megabase of genome that we study. And this is an important factor because it also affects the therapeutic considerations for patients with melanoma. Similarly, 
when we look at the actual genomic signatures in melanoma, the UV signature depicted in yellow in here is really the most prevalent type of signature you see in this particular tumor compared to other tumors where you see other types of tumor or other types of signatures that are not related to UV. And these UV signatures are characteristically either UVB related, which are a switch in the DNA from a C to T that we call usually transition, or UVA types of transversions, which are less common than the UVB, but also can be seen in the setting of UV signatures in melanoma. Another risk factor, as I mentioned before, is skin pigmentation and tanning ability. This is the Fitzpatrick classification of skins that go from type 1, which is usually fair, red-headed people with freckles, to type 6, which is usually darker Africans and indigenous Australians. And in between, you have really a spectrum going from northern Asians, light brown skins, which is type 3, type 4, which is moderate brown skin, and then type 5, which is the dark brown skin. This is very important because this classification actually by itself has been studied in numerous large-scale observational studies and meta-analyses that showed that type 1 and 2 skin is associated with a higher risk of developing melanoma compared to type 3 to 6 because this subset of patients tend to burn and not tan. Similarly, hair color, red, blonde versus black is, or dark is usually associated with a higher risk of melanoma, akin also to freckles, the presence of freckles, and usually numerous freckles is also another risk factor that have been studied, and the eye color, light green versus uh, dark brown or uh, black eye color. So all of these factors are important to consider when we think about melanomas. Another factor that is also studied in melanoma is the presence of what we call typical and atypical nevi. Typical is on the left, atypical is on, on the right. The way to think about them is just like two cousins of the same entity, but one is a little bit uglier. You can see here that this one is a bit more irregular, more variegated, has different shades. This one is really very round and usually has a hair in it. When it has a hair in it, that's usually a good sign. We know that 20 to 30% of melanomas are associated with nevi, and we know actually that this is not always a linear progression in a way that these nevi are not always the causative lesion for melanoma, but rather just a strong phenotypic marker that increases the risk of melanoma development. And here are some numbers that I'm leaving for you to just have an idea that even when you have typical nevi, patients with over 50 to 100 typical nevi have a higher risk of developing melanoma compared to patients with no typical nevi. A similar story happens in the pediatric population when we deal with what we call large congenital or giant congenital nevi, which are usually more than 20 centimeter, and I'm showing a picture of it here. Those particular patients are at a higher risk of developing melanoma with a lifetime risk of 2 to 5%. The number of dysplastic nevi is also important, or atypical nevi. Dysplastic and atypical is a terminology that we use interchangeably. Atypical is mostly on the clinical side, dysplastic on the histological diagnosis side, but they're both kind of interchangeably used in the derm path community and among dermatologists. Uh, the relative risk for one single atypical nevus in, in patients is 1.5 compared to 6.3 in patients with five or more atypical nevi. Family history is also very important. I said before that 10% of melanomas are actually inherited in many ways. And 50% of those inherited melanomas are related to what we call high penetrance genes. And those genes include CDKN2A, which is a tumor suppressor gene that usually puts break on the cell proliferation. And when this gene is actually affected, the cell proliferates in a very uncontrolled way, leading to actual melanoma melanoma development and progression. Similarly, CDK4 is another player that accounts for less, if you want, of the cases of familial melanoma. And recently, TERT, which is the telomerase reverse transcriptase gene responsible for restoration of the ends of the chromosomes, is also a very important gene that has been implicated in familial melanoma. These are very important melanomas to consider because in this patient population, screening for melanoma should occur earlier and uh, counseling about best practices in terms of protection from sun exposure is important at an earlier age. So what are the molecular mechanisms of melanomagenesis? This is the Clark's progression model that was described by Dr. Clark's and reviewed in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006. And this is really kind of the 
progression model where the proposed sequential event in melanoma development starts with a quiescent or dormant melanocyte that one day decides to become a benign nevus. And then one day that benign nevus develops into an ugly nevus or dysplastic nevus. And then one day sequentially acquiring more genomic and more genomic complexity evolves into an in situ melanoma, which is not invasive yet. And then one day it goes into an invasive melanoma and then it goes on the bloodstream and becomes a metastatic melanoma. These are the images here of the different stages where you can see a benign nevus to a dysplastic nevus to an in situ and then into an invasive nodular melanoma. While this model is accepted among different experts, it's not the only model for melanoma development, but it, it's actually, for me, I find it very helpful because it mirrors in many ways the genomic complexity that you see in melanoma. And on the left side here, I know this is a very complex image, but I wanted to include it just to kind of shed the light of how complex at the genomic level melanomas are. In more than 90% of these cases, there is really a backbone that we always see, which is an activation of a specific molecular pathway that we call the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway, which is MAPK pathway. And I zoomed in on this pathway in here, which includes numerous players such as BRAF, such as MEC, such as ERK. And all of these genes are affected by either point mutations or copy number alterations that lead to a proliferation and growth that is uncontrolled, which leads to melanoma development. Now, the caveat is that the activation of this particular pathway is important, but it's not enough for the actual aggressive phenotype that you see in melanoma. And this is where you start seeing involvement of other tumor suppressor genes, such as NF1, such as CDKN2A or P10, or other oncogene, which usually activate more <clears throat> proliferation, such as CDK4, cyclin D1, or even actually seek it. And these are important not only from a biological standpoint, but also from a therapeutic and even diagnostic standpoint. We use these signatures on a daily basis to diagnose and to help us in challenging cases. And the actual evolution from precursor lesions to melanoma has been studied extensively. And now we know enough that in patients with melanomas arising in nevi, this activation of the MAPK pathway is not enough for melanoma development, but is kind of an initial signature that you see. And this is from a study looking at melanomas arising in nevi, where you can see actually all the nevi harboring the BRAF V600E e mutation, which is one of the most common mutations. But then in the melanomas, you can see the genomic complexity and the acquisition of numerous additional genomic events affecting genes that you don't see usually in benign and the benign counterpart, notably the CDKN2A, which is a major pivotal gene in melanoma, homozygous loss, and the third gain that you don't see usually in the benign lesions, but you see in invasive melanoma. Not surprisingly, the mutational burden or the number of mutation increases also as your tumor becomes more aggressive. So invasive melanomas tend to have way more genomic complexity and copy number alterations compared to benign nevi. And these are important, oh, Pardon. And these are actually important genomic features that we use when we're trying to classify lesions. Association between genomic uh, findings and the clinical correlates showed actually that uh, melanomas with brf 600 e tend to happen mostly on the trunk, whether it's on the back or on the chest, while the CKIT, which is another oncogene mutations, tend to be enriched in a specific type of melanoma that we call acral or mucosal melanoma. Similarly, TP53, which is another tumor suppressor gene seen in other types of cancers, is also enriched in the head and neck and in sun damaged melanoma, but not in other sites. Melanomas that ha happen on the chronically sun-damaged skin, as I mentioned before, tend to show more solar damage in the skin, which is also something that we can assess on the slides. And this is really kind of a scale of what we call the sun damage or actinic damage or solar elastosis. The more blue it is, the more sun damage the skin has suffered. And usually melanomas with chronic sun exposure tend to have a higher mutational burden or a higher number of mutations, as well as a higher uh, degree of solar elastosis and more severe actinic damage. 90%, as I said, are activated by the MAPK pathway in melanomas, but 10% of the cases do not harbor the typical MAPK pathway activation, but rather they harbor a very specific type of genomic uh, 
event that we see in other tumors relatively frequently, like lung adenocarcinomas. And this type of event we call gene rearrangement or translocation, where part of a gene fuses with another part of a gene and activates that gene downstream. And the prototype of these types of translocations are BRAF translocations, but it's not the only one. Recently, ROS1, ALK, RET and NTRAC1, all of which have been, have been implicated in other tumors, as I said, such as colorectal carcinoma or lung adenocarcinoma, have been shown to be actually translocated and rearranged in melanomas, and mostly in a specific type of melanoma called Spitz melanoma. And this is important because all of those drugs has, uh, all of those, pardon, all of those rearrangements have specific targeted therapies, and essentially that could potentially help patients with these type of rearrangement. And I'm showing here some preclinical data, and as well, there's also clinical data now showing efficacy in patients with melanomas harboring these particular gene rearrangements. This enrichment in the actually knowledge of the genomics of melanoma enabled the WHO reclassification that happened in 2018 when the panel of experts came together for four days and reclassified melanomas into eight distinct types of melanomas based on their epidemiology, clinical and histological morphology, and genomic characteristics. And really now when we think about melanomas, there are nine types of melanoma, or if you want to, the nodular melanoma, which used to be considered a, a, a subtype by itself before, is now considered just a morphological variant with eight main categories of melanoma. And these eight categories of melanomas could be classified in three major groups. The group of melanoma with low UV radiation exposure or what we call CSD, chronic sun damage, low chronic sun damage. This is a group of melanoma that is enriched for the BRAF V600E mutation. This group of melanoma can have sometimes additional events depending on the precursor lesion of note that in this classification, melanoma is always put on a spectrum where it comes from a precursor lesion, which can be true and can be sometimes untrue depending on the clinical context. In the setting of melanomas arising in deep penetrating nevi, on top of the BRAF mutation, you will have mutations in the beta-catenin pathway and the pigmented epithelial melanocytoma, which is a, or melanomas arising in the pigmented epithelial melanocytomas, which are pretty rare, you will see events affecting the protein kinase C alpha, which is usually also another event you see with BRAF. In the setting of the high UV radiation exposure or high chronic sun damage melanoma, which usually tend to occur at a higher age compared to the low UV radiation exposure, there are two major subtypes, the lentigomaligna melanoma and desmoplastic melanoma. And both of those share a prevalence, a higher prevalence of NRAS mutations and NF1 mutations and less BRAF mutations. And even the BRAF mutations are not the same because usually they're non-V600E mutations. With an addition, of course, a smatter of other tumor suppressor genes that I mentioned before. Group three of melanomas in the WHO classification is really a mishmash of all what we call the weird melanomas. And these include Spitz melanoma that I mentioned before, which actually is very enriched for those rearrangements, including ROS1, RET, NTRAC, and MET, which occur actually in 50 to 60% of Spitz melanoma and atypical spitzoid tumors. So this is very important to consider when we have a spitzoid morphology. Acral and mucosal melanomas, I like to think about them as cousins because they do happen in different sites. They do have a low mutational burden because typically they're not sun exposed and both share a prevalence, a higher prevalence of KIT mutations and amplifications, NRAS mutations, less BRAF, and in the setting of acral melanomas, they do have NTRAC and ALK rearrangements. Melanomas in congenital nevi are usually rare, and when they do occur, they tend to have more NRAS mutations rather than BRAF mutations. And then the last category is melanomas arising in blue nevi, which is extremely rare, but typically presents with GNAC mutations, which is the G-alpha protein, and GNA11, which are usually seen also in uveal melanoma. So I hope with this short but dense talk, I was able to shed the light on the numerous risk factors involved in melanoma, including both environmental and hereditary factors. And I hope that I was able to convey the message that I do not think of melanoma, but rather melanomas, because actually it's a very heterogeneous disease, both at the clinical and molecular level. And as a dermatopathologist and molecular pathologist who deals with this entity on a daily basis, I strongly believe that ancillary genomic analysis 
is important because it enables both accurate classification of monocytic neoplasms and guides treatment decisions. And with that, I thank you for having me today and thank you. <laughs>